Hey guys, welcome back to another weekly tech tip here at 45 Drives. So this week marks the beginning of a really cool series that I'm going to be working on, and that is benchmarking for your workload. So you may have seen in my previous video that I did was based on ZFS. This time it's all going to be centered around Ceph. So strap in because we're going to get into it. Welcome back to my benchmarking for your workload series. So my last video talked about ZFS and I talked about performance characteristics, some different workloads, as well as architectural considerations you can make with ZFS to improve performance. So today marks the beginning of a multi-part Ceph video series that will be centered around, you guessed it, Ceph. And thank you, by the way, for getting me those 100 likes. You really know how to make a guy feel special. Uh, keep them coming. So I think in the previous video, really could have benefited though from breaking up into small, more digestible chunks. And as someone at Reddit rightly pointed out, trying to make a generalized video about benchmarking Ceph is ambitious at best, but pretty much futile at worst. Because there's just so many things to take into account and so many different ways to use Ceph. So that's why we're gonna take this step by step by first starting with getting the hardware and the environment ready in part one. So I'm not actually gonna give hardware recommendations on this video for a few reasons. First one, you can find that information really easily on Ceph Stock's recommended hardware page and because the hardware you pick really should be a reflection of your needs. Well, Ceph has some best practices for hardware. I've seen some pretty amazing Ceph clusters running on Raspberry Pis that suit the user's needs perfectly. So it all comes down to managing your expectations and building to your needs. So we're gonna start by getting some baseline numbers so you don't end up pulling your hair out to find the root cause of performance issues after the Ceph cluster is up and running, only to find out that you have one or two disks that are severely underperforming compared to the rest. And just on a quick aside, in a Ceph cluster, the slowest part of the chain will have a very real impact on the performance of your overall cluster. So you definitely want to weed out any underperforming drives or nodes really early on. So in this video, we're going to look at running an IOPS and throughput benchmark on your underlying disks. So that will eventually make up your OSDs. Then we'll look at benchmarking your network with iperf tests to make sure that your network is performing exactly as it should and that there's no bandwidth issues. From there, we'll do some latency tests between the nodes themselves. And finally, we'll take a look at TuneD to get our servers performing with the lowest possible latency we can. Latency really is the biggest killer of Ceph performance, so anything we can do to reduce that latency throughout the entire environment can really go a long way. So we'll be using a TuneD profile to help with that. And then that will just about wrap up part one of the series. Then in the following videos, we'll look at optimizing your cluster for your use case, whether that be CephFS, RBD, or RGW, and even more specific by the actual workload you'll be performing on the storage medium itself. For example, not all file systems are made equal. Some center around small file I.O. and are metadata intensive, whereas some others may just need really great sequential performance for big files with very simple directory layouts. And the same goes for block as well as object. So we're going to benchmark all storage types in Ceph using some really cool tools along the way, like Cosbench for object, File for block, and maybe even some really cool file system specific benchmarks to try to give our MDS a good workout for the CephFS benchmarks. I'll show off some possible Ceph specific tunings to help out with the different workloads and some other cool tricks along the way. So strap in. I'm really excited to get this series started with part one. So as you can see, as usual, I have an agenda up on the screen, so we're going to get to it here and we'll just kind of go through what this demo is going to entail. So first we're going to start with benchmarking your disks that will eventually make up our OSDs and or our RocksDB slash wall devices if we're going to use those. So we're going to do some very, very simple benchmarks here. First one is just a very, very simple random IO 4K benchmark with one job, one queue depth, and we're going to run that for 60 seconds. This is to make sure that our disk is performing as it should as far as IOPS go. We want to make sure we have a nice high IOP range for all the disks that we're going to use. The next one is going to be more throughput based, just to make sure that the disk is able to handle as much throughput as we possibly can see in it and, and how much we can get out of those disks. So it's very similar, but it's not a random write, it's a standard write, it's a one meg block size, which is not something you're ever really going to see out in the wild in a real workload, but it'll let us see just how much uh, throughput this drive can actually handle. And again, it's just a single job, single queue depth, and we'll run that. Once we get a good handle on all of our disks in our Ceph cluster and how well they're gonna perform before we actually build it, then we're gonna do some benchmarking of our network's performance. So this is probably 
if not the most important, maybe the second most important behind your disks um, for, for a clustered environment, especially a Ceph clustered environment, because it is all over the network and your network performance and your network latency really are going to be paramount to the performance of your cluster. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna run some iPerf tests on all of our nodes. Uh, I'm just gonna do it between two nodes, but I'm saying if you were to do this in a real environment, you'd wanna make sure all interfaces were benchmarked um, and all, all interfaces, you have an idea of their actual uh, bandwidth limitations or performance. So we're gonna make sure when we do that that our retransmission light, uh, rate is not too high and then also that our congestion window is not too small. And I'll talk what that means and I'll talk and I'll show that off when we actually run through the tests. Uh, then we'll just do a simple ping test also. It's very important because it just shows latency. It, it sounds simple, but it's important. It's good to get an idea on where the latency is between your hosts. Oh, and I also missed one as well. So we're going to actually, actually run this netstack command. So this is good to get an idea on if you're getting a lot of dropped packets or if you have any error packets that are coming through your system. So it's good to, to get an overview on that after you run some benchmarks and, and some numbers. Um, then we're going to look at actually tuning our environment. So this talk goes really, really deep. I'm going to include an actual document made by Red Hat all about tuning your environment. Um, so your OS, your CPU, your power states, really the entire environment is important. But what we're going to look at today is we're going to use a tool called TuneD, uh, or Tuned maybe is how some people might say it. But uh, And what it does is it's great because it has profiles. And it gives you the ability to make a lot of changes in your environment by just turning on specific profiles. And the profile that we're going to use is called a network latency uh, performance profile. And this does a lot of really cool things. We're actually going to show that off in one of the commands. Um, but this, more than anything, uh, make sure that the deeper C states of our CPU or our sleep states or idle states are disabled um, because that really can be a killer of performance as far as latency goes in a CPU. And again, if you want to know more about this, I will link something below so you can read up and really go in depth on it. But the long and short of it is we want to reduce any latency we can throughout the entire chain and this is going to help that. So I'll show that off. Uh, one thing too is, is your BIOS may clobber some of these uh, settings. So I will talk about just going in your BIOS, make sure that you don't have anything that's overruling what you're setting in here. That is very important as well. Um, and then from there, uh, we're pretty much going to wrap it up at that point. That's going to be kind of our pre-check environment before we go and actually set up a Ceph cluster and then begin actually uh, benchmarking the cluster itself. So without further ado, let's get started. The first one we're going to do is we're going to take a look. And, and by the way, guys, this is, says it's uh, Petasan 1 and 2. Um, it is actually just a standard Ceph cluster nodes, but they're not even in a cluster yet. Um, but it's just the host name I didn't get to change in time for the demo. So we have two Ubuntu nodes, which is what's most important running on Linux. And if we do an LS block, we see we have a, a, a list of different disks in this server. So we're going to benchmark some of these SSDs that we're going to be using in this cluster. So SDL is one of them. So I'm just going to run one of these first tests here. And let's get a baseline on the IOPS of one of these disks. All right, so we have our results running back here, so we can get an overview. We have a, in the realm of 14.2 thousand IOPS for this drive, for this SSD. So that's great. We're going to take that down and take that of note so we know exactly how that is performing. Now, where you really get a good understanding on how these drives are going to perform is when you benchmark the same drive over and over, or the same model of drive, not the same drive. Uh, model over and over and you see if there's any variance between them and so we did the first one here and now let's try another one that's on the same uh, host and it's the same type of SSD and see if we get the exact same performance because that's really what's most important here. We want to make sure that the variance isn't really crazy from disk to disk. So let's go down to SNM and we'll run the benchmark on SD, sorry SD, yeah SDM, sorry about that. So let's start that one and we'll run the exact same test. 
Okay, so we have our results back in exactly what we were hoping to see. We've got the exact same amount of IOPS coming from that drive as well. And so this is something that you would definitely want to do on all your drives. It's not going to take too long. It's about 60 seconds for each disc, each disc and it definitely plays a big role in not pulling your hair out once you have your cluster up and running and trying to figure out where the performance issues lie. So with that being said, we did the IOPS benchmark. Now let's quickly just run a throughput benchmark on that same drive and we'll move on. Okay, so there we go. So now we have a good baseline on this disk as well. We have a bandwidth of upwards of 738 bytes, and that's great. That's a good, exactly what you'd want to see for a disk like this or an SSD like this. So you would run through and do that exact thing on all your drives. So moving forward to our actual bandwidth, our network performance benchmarking, let's take a look at that. So we have two nodes in this what's soon to be Ceph cluster. And so we're going to have to choose one that's going to be a client and one that's going to be a server. Um, so iPerf might be already installed on your distro if you're going to run this, but if it's not, it's just iPerf 3 is what I would recommend using. So it would be apt install iPerf 3 and it would install, or if you're on a YUM or, or RPM, what have you, um, use your package manager that you would have on your distro. So once that's installed, you decide which uh, one you're going to use. So we have some 10 gig networks here, and I would recommend, I mean, obviously, if you want a high performance Ceph cluster, it's recommended you're going to have at least 10 gigabit, but we've seen, like I said, with those Raspberry Pi network, or Raspberry Pi clusters, we've seen clusters out there with uh, one gig networks as well that work just fine for their use case. But now let's get an overview and let's start, start testing this network here. So we're going to choose one of these here to be a server. Okay, so we're going to choose node 2 to listen on port 5201 as a server. And make sure as well if you have any firewall on that you turn that off or at least you um, allow traffic over 5201 or whichever port you use before you do this. And now we're going to set up our client. So you'll notice what I'm doing here is I'm setting an interface that we want to send this over because in a Ceph cluster especially you may have uh, multiple different active interfaces. You might have a back-end network that's on a different subnet from your front-end network, or it might be on the, you might have multiple interfaces on the same network. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're forcing the, this traffic down the correct interfaces. So uh, I just reset. <laughs> so let's just run this here, copy this up, and let's run this, ben, or this iPerf test. Okay, so we can see we're now connected. Uh, we've got our bandwidth upwards of 10 gigabits, which is exactly what we would hope. You're never going to see that full 10 gigabit pipe filled because there's always going to be overhead. But now we want to look at some other things as well. So we have retransmission and we have our congestion window. So these are good things to look at to understand how your network is performing. So retransmission is how many times the sender had to resend a given packet before it was actually accepted by the receiver. And the congestion window is the amount of data that can be sent without having to get an acknowledgement sent back. So if your network is uh, especially congested, that congestion window will be very small because you're only going to be able to send a little bit of traffic. Um, if you don't have a lot of congestion, it can get larger and larger. So if you can see it upwards around one megabyte, you're in a really great, great state. You don't have a lot of congestion on that network. And we can see here, we only have a few of these actual transfers that ever had any retransmissions, but it, it's normal that you're going to need range retransmissions. But if you see upwards, you know, of hundreds or thousands of them, then you may have an issue happening on your network. So this looks all great to me though. And the last thing we're gonna to wanna to do is do the exact same thing, but in reverse, because we, we tested one way. And in order to do that, you don't have to switch the sender and receiver. You just use the dash large R flag and the send gets reversed and the receiver gets reversed. So now we can see on the other side here, we're having our benchmark run again. And again, we're getting just about that 10 gigabit uh, bandwidth over this transfer and our retransmission rate is very, very low, almost zero, and our congestion window is not too small. So we're in a great, great state right now. And we can see that we transfer upwards of 11 gigabytes um, in that short period of time. So everything is working exactly as it should as far as the throughput goes. Now, similar to last time, 
you did, well, I did this on two nodes, on two interfaces, you're going to want to make sure you do this on all interfaces in your nodes that are going to be in your Ceph cluster because it is important to get a full picture on your environment. All right, so for the next part here, we're just going to run a quick command here, and I'll explain what it does um, because it is important. We're just going to run a netstat-i to get an overview on our packets and the state of what's, hap what's been happening up until now. So let's go netstat-i, and we can get an overview here of all of the receiving packets that were okay, any that were in error, and we can see we don't have any error packets, which is exactly what you would hope to see. We do have some drop packets, which again is totally normal. You're going to see that in any environment. Uh, we have some our, our sent uh, packets, and we can see we've got them. They're all okay, but we have no errors and we have no drops on the sent, so that's perfect. Um, but it's a good one to to actually check out over time to see if your network is experiencing any kind of drops or any kind of issues. All right, so for the next network or the last network thing that we want to look at is a simple ping test that I'm sure everyone has done uh, once or twice in their day. So we can get a look here on node 2, we're going to ping this IP of node 2 from node 1. So let's go, and we can see our latency is very, very low here, less than a millisecond, 0.04 of a millisecond in fact, which is exactly what you would hope. Anything less than a millisecond is great, uh, but anytime you can get that lower, it's always going to be helpful in Ceph. Um, Ceph really does hinge on latency being as low as possible. I don't want to say hinge because you can still run a cluster, but performance is going to be better, user experience is going to be better, the lower you can get your latency. And that brings me perfectly to what we're going to talk about next, and that's tuning our system for low latency. So what we're going to do is we're going to want to disable some of the deeper C states uh, of your CPU, which is like your idle or sleep states, and we're going to want to tune your CPU's P states or its, its peak performance states um, where the clock is boosting as high as possible to its mass, max boost clocks. Um, and so to do that, I mean, you can go into your BIOS and most times and you can enable that and play with that from there if you know what you're doing. But a really cool tool is TuneD or Tune, however it's uh, pronounced officially. Um, and it, it's really cool because it has all these different profiles that we can use that bring together a large amount of different optimizations and puts them into one spot and it does it for you. Now, I did mention your BIOS could clobber some of this um, in certain instances. So there is some tests to see if it's doing what you hope it's doing. And we'll talk about that in a second here. So just to start though, let's take a look at the different list of profiles that we have access to here. So to do that, we're going to run a TuneD ADM uh, list. So we're just going to list all these. So we can see there's a lot of these here, right? Balanced CPU, uh, we've got network latency, network performance, network throughput, um, power save, of course, if you want to lower the actual clock speeds of your CPU. Um, so there's a lot of them here, right? Throughput performance, so all different types of things you're looking to achieve with your server or servers, you can uh, have TuneD help you with that. But like I said, we want to go for max or minimum latency as possible. So we're going to look at network latency. So before we do that, let's take a look at what's active right now by default. So let's just cat etsy uh, tund current or active profile. So we can see it's set the balance by default. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to make the switch. But before we do that, let's take a look at some of the actual changes that these profiles make. So we're looking right now at latency performance. So we can see we have like a governor set to performance mode. We have our um, different VM swappiness. We have uh, cache migration. We have a lot of things that are set by default here. And if we take a look at network latency, which is actually a subset of the latency performance profile. So the network latency one is actually going to enable all of these plus some of these down here, which are great. So, um, and specifically, what this one is going to do is it's going to reduce the impact of power management, reduce task migrations, and also reduce the amount of outstanding, outstanding cache or dirty page cache kept in memory. So lots of good stuff there. So let's take a look at this one and let's enable it by default. So let's clear this. And what we're gonna wanna do to turn this on or enable it is very simple, ADM, Profile, Network, Latency. And it'll hang for a second and then it'll deploy it. So now if we take a look at TuneD, 
we can see we've now moved to network latency. So you're gonna to wanna to reboot for this to take uh, actual take effect on your server. And there's some things you can do to make sure that it's actually working. So let's take a look at our turbo stat. And let's just get it to stop after five seconds here. So it's gonna run through a lot of information about your CPU. But first, what we're gonna see here in a second is we get a lot of information about our CPU here. So we can see a number of different C states. Actually, let me make this a little bigger and go again. One thing you're gonna wanna make sure is you wanna make sure that if you enable this uh, profile, when you do reboot your machine, you're gonna wanna make sure that all of your cores, so in this instance, it's just a small four core CPU, you're gonna wanna make sure that all of your cores have 100% in the C1 sleep state. Um, see, we can have, we have multiple other C states, which are deeper C states, which provide more and more latency as you go down the chain. So what we're looking to do is we're gonna make sure that our CPU never comes out of C1. And right now, we don't have any active workload or anything happening on it. But what you can do is where I ran that turbo stat command, uh, with sleep five, it'll just stop. It'll, it'll run it once and then it'll stop. If you remove that, it'll continuously update this and show you what's happening with your CPU. So when you do the reboot, um, run a workload on your CPU and run this command. And then you can make sure that all your CPU cores are actually in the C1 and that they don't go any further. And then you'll know that the profile is actually working for you at that point. So that's gonna give you a really good uh, latency decrease um, along with, there's gonna be some other things as well once we get into the Ceph specific stuff that we can do to again, decrease latency as much as humanly possible. But that actually kind of gets to the heart of, of this demo. We went over the benchmarking of the disks, which is very important, benchmarking our network, making sure that the bandwidth is there, then also getting our environment ready to go in the best state it possibly can. There are some other things as well, like uh, making sure you profile for your NUMA nodes, CPU NUMA nodes. It can get very, very complex, but again, I will post an article written by Red Hat that goes through a whole host of different optimizations you can make um, if you really wanna take the time and, and try all these things but one thing I will say is there's never going to be a silver bullet you're never going to see this one thing that makes all the difference in the world um, and just makes everything better and I think a lot of times people want that but unfortunately it just doesn't work that way but what you can get is a nice good accumulation of best practices to give you a really well performing environment and that's exactly what we're going to try to do in this series of videos so we're gonna end this here, um, we'll, and then we'll pick up with some more Ceph specific things in the next videos to come. All right guys, so that just about wraps up part one of this series. Uh, I know there wasn't a ton of very specific to Ceph things, but I promise they're coming. Just wanted to get into getting your environment ready and making sure everything is good to go before you actually start the journey down your Ceph environment. So with that being said, um, videos are definitely gonna be coming very soon. I don't wanna put a date on them obviously because I do have a job here day to day that I have to work on as well. Um, but I promise you that I will be working on them and getting them out as soon as possible. And I do have a lot of really cool tips that I wanna get out and, and help you guys with in the environment that are interested to learn Ceph, and interested to improve the performance of your Ceph cluster. Oh, one last thing. So before I go, I wanna get you guys to tell us what you wanna see next. So we're gonna do everything. I'm not gonna skimp out here. We're gonna do file block and object. Just wanna know what does the community wanna see first? Um, you let us know down below and that's what we'll start working on next. So we'll, we'll cover file system. If you wanna see some file system stuff, um, block RBD in different environments, and then also uh, RGW with S3, maybe Swift, but I think we'll cover mostly S3. Um, and then also, of course, we're gonna look at under the hood tunings and things like that, things that you can do in general sense to make your Ceph cluster perform better um, and, and things like that. So just let us know. What do you wanna see first? And with that being said, I'll see you on the next one.